All right, I'm going to ask you to please stand with me one more time as we sing Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah. And also at this time, we will dismiss our young ones downstairs at Children's Church. <clears throat> Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. From the heavens, praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest. All his angels praise proclaim. All his hosts together praise him. Sun and moon and stars on high. Praise him, O ye heaven of heavens, and ye floods above the sky. Well, let them praise his give Jehovah. For his name alone is high, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Let them praises give Jehovah, all their maiden his command. Then forever he established, his decree shall ever stand. From the earth, O oh, praise Jehovah, all ye flood, ye dragons all. Fire and hail and snow and vapors, stormy winds that hear him call. Let them praise give Jehovah, for his name alone is high, and his glory is exalted, and his glory exalted and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky all ye fruitful trees and cedars all ye hills and mountains high creepy things and beast and cattle Birds that in the heavens fly, kings of earth and all ye people, princes greater, judges all. Praise his name, young men and maidens, aged men then children small. Let them praise, just give Jehovah, for his name alone is high, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, good morning. Glad that you are here. I appreciate Jordan very much for his talent, his passion, his desire. That was incredible. Who participated in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner last year? Raise your hand. There's a few. Well, it's back this month. And Renee Barton, where are you, Renee? There she is, is going to coordinate, coordinate that this year. And there is um, there's an informational meeting just right after this service is over. Uh, if, if, if you're visiting, whatever, feel free. But over on the stage back there, just Head that way and we'll visit while other people are visiting out here. If you have any questions, now if you don't have any questions, you just sign up. You can either be a host or you can be a guest. And you don't know which is which until <coughs> earlier that day. 
And so uh, I always tell people, if there are people you don't like and don't want to eat with, don't sign up. Because you don't know where you're going or who you're going to eat with. That's the whole point. Guess who's coming to dinner. So um, uh, the sign-up sheets are out here on the table. And also sign up for this afternoon's activities at 2 o'clock. And by the way, we've taken one of the activities off, which was the game room, because nobody signed up. So there shouldn't be any disappointment. That means you weren't interested. If you didn't sign up, you weren't interested. It's gone. All right, so there are three book clubs presently and the video series, The Chosen. That is at 2 o'clock this afternoon, today. Everybody say today. today. 2 o'clock. All right. <laughs> I'm trying to think of something to say, but I'm slow. Okay. I am not much of a basketball player nor a fan, with some exceptions. I was a big Chicago Bulls fan with Michael Jordan. I loved watching Michael Jordan. Actually, I enjoyed him at North Carolina as well, but... But I, I loved watching the Bulls with Michael Jordan. Uh, and I should clarify, pre-second retirement. Okay? After the second retirement, it wasn't the same. First retirement was okay. Then I was able to go and actually watch him play baseball in Hoover uh, as he tried to become a baseball player and continue his baseball career. He had always been a baseball player. Uh, March Madness. There's just something about March Madness. I, I don't watch college basketball at all until March Madness comes along. And then it's fun to watch. And there are certain teams that are just, seems like they're always there. You know, Kentucky. Yeah, who likes Kentucky? <laughs> Actually, I'm a Kentucky fan in basketball, unless they're playing Alabama. Uh, let's say who else is there? North Carolina is usually there. Duke is usually there. Uh, lately, there's been some... Teams you never heard of, and they're always there, it seems like. And, and um, for years ago, uh, and maybe some recently, UCLA seems like they were associated with March Madness. But there is one player that I did not watch, but I love to watch documentaries on, Pete Maravich. How many of you watched Pete Maravich play basketball? There's a couple, two or three really old people. They watched. Yeah. <laughs> What was his nickname? Pistol Pete. Pistol Pete. His name is synonymous with college basketball greatness. While a freshman at LS Who, he was so exciting to watch that fans would go to the freshman game and leave afterwards. They didn't want to watch the varsity. They weren't any good. But the freshman team, when he was on it, was incredible. And then eventually, of course, the next year and following, he made the varsity team and while playing for LSU, he set 43 NCAA records. Just an incredible basketball player. Not only did he have talent, but he had passion. See, talent without passion, not all that great. But talent with passion makes all the difference in the world. James Dobson writes about him in one of his books. He was actually in the room when Pete Maravich fell to the floor having a heart attack. And it was James Dobson who administered CPR. Now, Pete Maravich would not survive that heart attack. I guess the moral of the story is, if James Dobson is in the room, pick somebody else to give you CPR. I'm not sure exactly how that works. But he was with him, and he said he was just an incredible person who lived not only for basketball, but he lived for Jesus Christ later in life. He had some issues uh, following his stint in, in uh, the professional uh, league, but he had talent and he had passion. We live in a time when people don't seem to care much about very many things. In, in fact, it seems like maybe we have talent, but passion doesn't always seem to be with it. Now, I'm a St. Louis Cardinals fan. <laughs> if you have a phone and hearing aids, you're probably listening. And a St. Louis phone, they're playing right now because they're out in San Diego or somewhere. You're probably listening, faking hearing me, like my wife, and listening to the St. Louis Cardinals game. But names like Albert Pujols and Yadier Molina and 
and those still playing like Adam Wainwright and Paul Goldschmidt, they mean something to me. They have talent and they have passion. It doesn't show it this year, but they have passion. I follow their careers year after year, and I've known some people, like my good friend Jerry Weber, who has worked for the same company basically his entire adult life. Because of a loyalty, he had talent, and he had passion about what he did. I kid him all the time, he's going to turn green one of these days, because he worked in a power plant, a nuclear power plant, still works in a nuclear power plant. Not only just in there, but he's gone, gone in where the core of the reactor is and torn his clothes while, you know, when they have to shower you in that special solution. And, and uh, so if, if you ever see him and he jerks or something, just I, I know why you just did that. <laughs> But we live in a free agency mentality world. I admit that I was a little hurt when Albert Pujols said, I love St. Louis, but I'm moving for money. What is a free agency mentality? Well, that's a term It was first used in professional sports that meant at some particular point in your contract, you can cut ties with your team. You're no longer legally bound to them. You become a free agent. You're on your own. You're at liberty to do your own thing. Pick your next place as long as they'll have you. That free agency mindset. We're in a series entitled Commitment. You can do religion as long as it's satisfying to you. That's the free agency mindset. You can do religion as long as it's personally convenient for you, as long as it makes you happy. And when it doesn't, you're free to do your own thing. That's the free agency mindset. Well, Christianity begins with Jesus calling us to make a personal commitment to Him. So he begins his ministry in Galilee. Jesus walks by the tax collecting area in Matthew chapter 9. And he said, it says, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. And he said, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed him. In Mark chapter 1, as was read to us just a few moments ago, down about verse 16 or so, Jesus is walking at the Sea of Galilee, and it says he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Jesus said, come follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Do you think they fully understand the implications? Do you think they fully understood at that moment who Jesus was and what he was all about? Probably not. Did they really think or even know or, or even have a clue he would be the Savior of the world? Probably not. But he calls us. And it's still a personal one-on-one -on -one encounter with the Galilean. Sometimes in large audiences like this, we think, well, he's calling the masses. Hopefully, as you read the Word of God, even though it may be a preacher that speaks publicly, it's still a very personal call from Jesus. And what does he say? Follow me. Follow me. The invitation has your name on it because Christ is not calling someone else. He's calling you. And no one else can respond for you. It's a do-it-yourself religion. And there's a personal call that you alone can answer. In the book of Acts, ten different individuals ask the all-important question, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says through Peter or Paul or some other teacher, come, follow me. He calls an African nobleman, an Ethiopian who's traveling home from Jerusalem, and God interrupts his trip by sending Philip to teach him about Jesus. And the text says that Philip begins with the very passage that the African man was reading, and he taught him all about this personal call of Jesus. And we discover the same story over and over and over in the book of Acts. Jesus Christ calls different people to become his followers. And with each one, what he desires is this very personal one-on-one -on -one relationship. So the African left the desert with more than just a religious discussion. There's even a sketch of procrastination in the book of Acts. 
Paul is speaking to King Agrippa. And when he finished his presentation, he had presented Jesus to him. And the king is so torn that he says, Paul, almost, can't even say it in anything other than King James, right? Because that's the way we learned it. Almost thou persuadest me. It takes a personal commitment of will that finally causes us to establish this relationship with Jesus. And when you hear the call, when you make that commitment, it means you're going to keep your promise to follow him regardless of what happens. It's a lifelong commitment. When you confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and you make that commitment to follow him, it's for life. When you walk down into the waters of the, of the baptistry and you're, you're ready to die to self and rise to a brand new life, it's a lifelong commitment. Amen. When we decide to follow Jesus, we make it personal because it's a commitment of will and heart. He doesn't want us to just assent to his existence. He wants us to commit our hearts, our lives, our minds and he calls us to die, not just in that watery grave, but each and every day. Die to yourself and live for me. It's a disturbing passage, Luke chapter 9. If anyone would come after me, finish it. He must deny himself, take up his cross. And follow me, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But he who wants to lose his life for me will save it. It's, pa it's a disturbing passage because of the symbol that he uses. If we want to follow him, we have to take up his cross. How easy it is for me to misunderstand the cross. My cross. What is your cross? Sometimes I've heard people say, it's my husband." or it's my wife, or it's my children, or whatever the case may be. I want you to look at these words again. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. Not your husband, not your wife, not your kids, not your job or whatever. Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me. What an incredible statement. When you look at a cross, what do you see? You see two lines, a vertical and a horizontal, and they intersect. And that's the way life is with heaven. The two intersect at the cross. But the trouble with Christianity is it's so daily. It's so every day. I mean, it doesn't quit. It just doesn't stop. It's there all the time, each and every day. And if that sounds like a total commitment, it is. At least twice, Paul described his own commitment while he's speaking to a group of elders. This is what he says in Acts chapter 20, beginning with verse 22. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. He knew that his life was in danger and he kept on. He knew that, that it could end at any time and he kept on. What a commitment. Then he says in the next chapter, Acts chapter 21, after we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. He came to us, took Paul's belt, tied his own feet and hands, and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews in Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, both we and the local people pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. But he went anyway because he was committed because it's each and every day Jesus calls him to love him more than we love our own lives. He wants us every day to say yes to his lordship. How many of you ran track in school? Raise your hand. If you ran track in school. Okay, that's not enough. How many of you have, know what track is? Raise your hand. Okay, that's better. I want you to think about running track. Makes me tired just thinking about it. But Paul likens commitment to, a, to, to a, a track event. 
running a race. He said toward the end of his life, I have finished the race. The 440. I ran that once. Key word is once. The 440. If you run the 440, and that's 440 meters, then you have to run 440 meters if you want to finish the race. You can't just run 220, though I was tempted to bow out at 220. You have to run all 440 meters to finish the race. But the free agency mentality is, well, I don't like this very much. I think I'm just going to pick something else, do something else. It, 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 there, there isn't quite the same mentality, commitment that is there, for the loyalty. Maybe that's the word I'm looking to. It has seeped over into all areas of life, including Christianity. But we're not the first run runners to struggle with finishing. Scripture is full of stories of runners that were struggling to finish the race. You open your Bible to Hebrews chapter 11 and you read about Abraham and Isaac and Joseph and Moses and Samson and Jephthah and, 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 and some of the other prophets. Here's what it begins. Hebrews 12 beginning with verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded or such a large crowd of witnesses is all around us, we have to get rid of everything that slows us down, especially the sin that just won't let go. And we have to be determined to run the race that's ahead of us. Keep our eyes on Jesus who leads us and makes our faith complete. He endured the shame of being nailed to a cross because he knew later on he would be glad he did. Now he's seated at the right hand of God's throne. Why? How? Because he finished the race. We are in a race and we're being encouraged. Jesus has already run his. And he's waiting for us at the finish line. And he calls us to focus on the finish. Keep your eyes on me. Don't look back. Look forward to the finish. Keep your eyes on the goal. Like Olympic runners who were encircled by a great coliseum of people in the Roman theaters, you're encircled by a great cloud of witnesses, Scripture says. People who have lived before you, they've already run their race and they're cheering you on. Can you imagine what a thrill it would be, what a stamina it adds to your willpower if you can see Abraham cheering your own. Noah is there. Moses is there. Peter is there clapping their hands. Can you hear them shouting, you can do it. Finish the race. Hang in there. No wonder Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8, 5, the, the Christians at Corinth gave themselves first to the Lord. Joe Almanza, maybe some of you have heard that name. He knows something about perseverance. In his early life, he lived a life of crime. He tells the story about how his dad took him and his brothers into a motel room in Mexico and he dumps out on the bed a large suitcase filled with money. It was money that he had made as a chief, uh, a chief of drug traffic in the area that they lived in in Mexico. And he shows his sons, this is what life can be. This is what is yours if you follow in my footsteps. And Joe did for a time, but eventually he found himself in prison. He ended up spending seven years in the Texas prison system. Now, he could have come out of that system and continued on with that life as the heir to drug traffic, literally millions of dollars at his disposal. But when he was in prison, he met Jesus Christ. Jesus called and said, follow me. Do you want to know what he did with the rest of his life? He would go and he would sit on a concrete floor in front of a cell door and bring a Bible and say, hey, you want to talk about the Bible? And he baptized so many people. He, 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 he studied with so many people. Huntsville, Texas, not far from where I attended high school, was the prison where he would sit and do that on a daily basis. The greatest commitment you ever make is your vow to Jesus Christ. Sometimes we sing the song, 
When I thought I could remember it, I only remember one phrase, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. And it finishes, I think, with no turning back. No turning back. Reminds me of another song. I think it's a Stephen Curtis Chapman song. I'm not sure, but it's called Burn the Ships. You ever heard that song? It's about explorers that go to a new island. And when they get there, they're looking at their ships and they're looking at their island. We don't want to be tempted to go home, so let's burn the ships that are out in the harbor. That's commitment. How is yours? We're about to sing a song of encouragement, and as we sing this song, would you consider your life? Would you consider your commitment? Would you consider all that is yours and all that is His? And how much does He deserve? If we can help you in this process, in this journey, would you come to the front? If you desire a more private setting, you can go back here to the office. One of our shepherds will meet you there. If it's more public you desire, just come to the front as we're singing this song and I'll sit down with you on one of the front pews and we'll talk about what's on your heart and mind and we will pray for you, we'll study with you. We want you to become a Christian. Or if we can help you along this walk, do so. Come to the front as we stand and as we sing.